thank you, Danny, for those kind words. And thank you for bringing this amazing community together. Um, I am Chris Howe. I'm the head of experience design at Clearleft, uh, an agency based in Brighton. And for the last 20 years working in digital, I've worked with digital teams to try to find interesting, elegant, inspiring solutions to design problems. And my intention in the next 25 minutes is to help you to unleash your inner innovator. So innovation and creativity are ambitiously big topics to cover in a day and an impossible topic to cover in 25 minutes. Um, there are piles of books on the subject, loads of frameworks, loads of models. Um, so for today, I'm less interested in those big paradigm shifts and more interested in what's in our gift to change. So I'm going to start with a very simple definition for innovation. I think innovation is the ability to create change in the world around you. And there are two words that I'm going to focus on today, and that is create change. So something that you do that introduces change, it might be to a product, might be to a service, might be to a process. But the important thing it's, is it's what you create leads to an impact. So innovation can happen throughout the design process. Um, I think you stand a better chance of creating change if you move to the left of the double diamond. Hopefully I've got the right hand up at this point. Um, so that you're able to influence decisions and to avoid design only being thought of as a delivery function. As designers, I strongly believe that we offer the most value when we're shaping problems to tackle and not just shipping features. Look to be a problem seeker, not just a problem solver. And there are plenty of examples of people making innovation by focusing on what's in their gift to change. I'm going to give you some examples. Uh, a service design example like the Human Library. The Human Library is a project that started in Denmark by two brothers as a small weekend get-together, as an event to create a safe space for people to have personal conversations with people they wouldn't normally meet, a way of challenging prejudice. 25 years on, it's a global event where readers effectively borrow human beings in order to have conversations that they wouldn't normally have access to. I've got a brand communication example from the Irish women's uh, rugby team, who this year changed the colour of their shorts from white to blue as a way of talking about and reducing period anxiety. Many sports teams have followed suit. But an innovation, a change in the conversation, and one that was in their gift to change. A more digital example, the one-click ordering button from Amazon. So the guy who wrote this software, Perry Hartman, um, joined Amazon in the mid-90s, and he heard Jeff Bezos talking about the need for frictionless ordering systems. And Hartman, largely as a skunkworks project, designed the software that led to a game change in online commerce. Now, this is not in my gift to change, but it was in his gift to change. So through this talk, I would like you to think about what you can change, what can you affect at work. It doesn't have to be super big. It doesn't have to change things on a global scale. But what can you do that incrementally makes that change happen? So I've got six tips that I'm going to go with uh, to share with you today to help you unleash your inner innovator. It's not a comprehensive list, um, and I would be really happy for you to give me your examples over a beer later on today. The first three of my tips focus on uh, approaches to take at work. The last three are ways to develop your inner innovator skills. And I'm going to start with one of my bugbears. I'm going to make a plea for you to stop using the phrase blue sky thinking. A long time ago, I went to uh, a pitch for a client. I mean, I say a client. We never got to work with this guy. And that will become apparent why in a minute. But three of us from an agency went up for a meeting. And this person surprised us by saying, I want some cool ideas. I'm going to give you 30 minutes in this room to come up with some new cool ideas. 
Now, um, it was a surprise to us that he took that approach. It was even more of a surprise that we gave it a go. And as you can imagine, that is not how you get to breakthrough ideas. Um, this guy came back 30 minutes later. No surprise, our ideas were obvious, incredibly poor quality, and we didn't win the project. Yet this is how many brainstorming workshops are structured. People are invited to come to a brainstorming workshop and they're given a task that is too broad and too vague. I'd recommend seeking out this article from the Harvard Business Review. Its premise is that companies often start their search for great ideas by encouraging two behaviours. One is getting people to think about wild, outside-of-the-box thinking, or conducting a quant analysis of their current data. And both of those approaches produce middling ideas at best. The problem with the first one is very few people are very good at unstructured, abstract brainstorming. The second is that if you're just looking at your current data, you're looking at the past. You're not looking at the opportunities. You're not looking at unmet user needs. So the premise of this article is to think differently, to think inside the box, but just to find a different box from the one you currently think in. So when looking for innovation, spend time and effort to come up with narrower and better focused questions to prompt broader, more expansive thinking. Some questions that we've found useful are looking at who else is dealing with this problem in a different sector, how are they going about doing that? Asking what would our best customers do if we didn't exist? Looking at which customers could be major users if we just removed one specific barrier that we hadn't previously considered. So looking at the box differently can provide better starting points for unlocking innovative ideas. And to help uncover breakthrough ideas, I like to look for that propelling question, that propelling question that mixes a bold ambition with a significant constraint. And I'm going to talk a lot about constraints today. So there are two useful frames for this. The question is, how might we? Uh, Harvard Business Review described this as the question for all innovators to ask. But it has to be ambitious. You need to sp spend time iterating on those statements. It's not a race to get a handful of mediocre statements. It needs to be a question that propels you forward, that creates energy, that excites your team to find a solution to it. The second one is we can if. Often one of the blockers to innovation in organizations is people tell you why something can't happen. And a good way around that is to list in one column, we can't because, get people to tell you why something can't happen. And in the next column, challenge them to flip that round and look at we can if. And you'll be amazed at how many barriers to change are relatively easy to overcome. That brings me on to constraints. Give me the freedom of a tight brief. Um, this comes from David Ogilvy, advertising man. And I think he's on to something here. The, the, to get focus, um, you can use constraints, and constraints are the secret to creativity. And you find this in many places, particularly outside of the digital world. Um, the creativity of origami comes from a constraint, a single piece of paper that you're not allowed to cut. Dr. Zeus's green eggs and ham comes from constraints. It was a challenge set to um, Dr. Zeus to write an entertaining book using no more than 50 distinct words. And I think we can learn a lot from poets when it comes to constraint. Poetry effectively is an art form with constraint at its core. Sonnets with 14 lines, 10 syllables per line, limericks with five lines and a prescribed rhyming scheme, univocalic poems where you only use one single vowel throughout all of the words. They are using creativity to help propel themselves forward, to come up with um, something amazing. And I think if you're in a project you would, and you're looking to innovate, look at the constraints, find your constraints, write your constraints down, lean into those constraints 
as a way of helping get something amazing happening. As Harry Baker says, everything's impossible until it isn't. There's a writer's cafe in Japan that has an innovative business model with constraints set at its heart. In this cafe, the tea and coffee are free, but you pay for procrastinating, for not completing work. As you enter this cafe, you take a card, you write down your work goal, you write down your deadline, and you write down the type of encouragement you require from the waiting staff. That might be a gentle prompt, gentle nudge, encouraging words. It might be being shouted at. And you then pay for missing the deadlines that you've set yourself. So an extreme form of setting constraints, but the writers that use it say it works. I would encourage you maybe to do this, but I would certainly encourage you to find the constraints and lean into them. I've got a thought experiment for you. From the five figures on the right, I'm going to get you to pick the one that is different from all the others. I'm going to give you 20 seconds to figure out your answer. I'm also going to apologise to Alice, because I know this is not scientifically controlled experiment sort of situation. Hopefully, everybody has got um, a shape in mind. Um, I would ask for hands, but I can't actually see if anybody's out there or not. Um, if you picked the triangle, well done. 63% of people, when this experiment is run, pick the triangle, because it's the only one with no curves. However, all of those shapes are unique in their own way. You could pick any of those shapes, and you would be correct. This experiment comes from Edward de Bono. And he uses it as a way of saying, as humans, we have a habit of stopping when we get to the first answer that solves the question. And what we're not very good at is then pushing forward to find other answers that solve the problem. That brings me to my second approach to innovation, which is generate more ideas. Uh, we heard this earlier from Tricky and Definitely agree, the best way to have a good idea is to have lots of ideas. Um, and you see this a lot in science. This quote comes from Linus Pauling, Nobel Prize winner, twice Nobel Prize winner, um, who was a chemist. Um, he made lots of change. He was definitely an innovator, very much like Thomas Edison, um, who's famed for his trial and error approach. Um, He's credited with saying the real measure of success is the number of experiments you can crowd into a 24-hour period. And I think that's true of designers. How can we generate more ideas? How can we generate them more quickly? And if only we had some ways of doing this. Well, we do. Um, design studio activities using six up, several rounds of sketching and critique is a great way to generate lots of ideas. Unblocking creativity by using different formats, designing the box, um, designing the movie poster, coming up with a dating profile for a product, always to unlock your mind to be more creative, to find that innovation. Using the immediate impossibles, designing the worst thing you can do as a way of then flipping that around and finding new ideas. Or using the lens of people or organisations. What would Florence Nightingale do? How would Nike tackle this problem? There are lots of design activities in our arsenal, in our toolkit, which help generate a volume of ideas. This photo of drawing on the cupboards in the Clayleft studio um, came from somebody that was new to our team. They looked at those cupboards, they thought they are perfect for six-up sketching. Um, most of us that worked in the studio for a long time were appalled that somebody would be scribbling on these cupboards. Innovation doesn't come from people who've been around for a long time. It comes from people that are looking at something afresh. Generating lots of ideas also includes creating prototypes that deliberately allow you to gather feedback more quickly so you can iterate and then repeat um, your experiments. Um, Paul Creedy, um, who was the inventor of the Gossamer Condor, won a 17-year unclaimed prize for human-powered flight. And he puts winning that prize down to not having the best solutions, 
but by having a plane that was deliberately created so that when it crashed, he could learn from those mistakes, rebuild it, try something new. And it crashed a lot, but he learned from those prototypes. And I think shrinking that feedback loop and making that feedback loop as small as possible so you can attest, adjust, retest ideas is one of those secrets of getting innovation out into the world. Another personal plea of mine is to rethink co-design. Um, I've seen lots of collaborative design sessions run by clients in person, in FigJam, on Miro, where designers expect everybody to grab a pen and draw an interface. And I think the danger of co-designing in that way is this. So Tom Curtis takes pictures from his kids, turns them into models. It's a really charming social media um, account to follow. But in asking clients and colleagues who aren't trained in design to sketch UI, you're likely to get this kind of parody of design. You get obvious ideas, badly thought through, that then becomes the design for the product. So I think we need to rethink how we do co-design and be more deliberate about thinking about um, how we're getting people involved in that. Dan Roan, in his book, uh, The Back of the Napkin, talks about three different um, types of people, three different types of visual thinkers. Um, he talks about black pen people, the people that grab the pen, they're happy to start sketching, which I'm guessing is most of us in this room. But most people that don't have the word designer in their job title find that really difficult. He then talks about um, yellow pen people, people that like to highlight, to add to designs that are happening. And then he talks about red pen people, the people that like to correct everything. They like to tell you why something won't work. And often in workshops, we don't like these people being in those workshops. But these people often have great detailed knowledge. They have experience, which we can really learn from when we want to innovate. So I'd like to encourage all of you to think about co-design in a way of making it easy for the people you want to co-design with. A clear left, we have a, a variety of ways of doing this to remove some of those barriers to encourage people to get involved in design. Um, we'll often take uh, printouts of current pages, um, cut them up, remove bits of content, or use post-it notes to create what a page should look like. But we're not looking for people to design the interface. We're looking for them to help focus on the structure. So structure over style. This works really well if you've got a workshop where you've got people that are responsible for publishing pages. They understand the content. Sometimes we use templates for, uh, with bits to fill in. So again, very lo-fi, but we'll ask people to take a part of a page. So to sketch out what the data might look like on a page or to list out the product benefits to promote. Again, it's making it easier for people to contribute. We're not asking them to design the page. We're asking them to help with parts of the page. And if I've got the chief executive, managing director, senior stakeholders, I like to move completely away from interfaces and start using things like journey maps or something where you can get them to contribute to what is the UX outcome you're looking for? What are the business metrics we want to change? Um, and then you go away and flip that round by creating an interface to show them later. So I think making it easy for your audience to contribute and co-design to the skills they have is the secret here. Another way of doing this is to think like a police photo fit artist. If you're really quick at sketching, sketch in front of people. You do the drawing. Um, you ask for a description, you draw it, you show it, you edit it, you show it again. And it's a good way for you to bring your skills and the person you're talking to to bring their skills. And in essence, this is what architects and garden designers do. They'll take a brief from you, they'll doodle, they'll show, they'll share, they'll take those inputs, and the fidelity will increase. And you've co-designed with them, but they haven't asked you to draw a house. They haven't asked you to draw your garden. So I'm going to move to three tips. Um, where you can train your inner innovator. So nobody is born an innovator. 
It's a skill that comes through practice. So the first thing I would say is do something creative and non-work related to open up your mind. Um, something that is creative and problem solving even better. Ideally something away from your screen. I'm showing you some of my drawings, not because I think they're good, but I think doing it and showing it is the important thing. I recently took an art class and the teacher was asked, how do I make fewer mistakes? How do I avoid making mistakes? And she reframed it by saying, it's a change in mindset. You need to, um, you need to start thinking of these as positive moments. You are on a journey doing something, going somewhere. An ex-colleague of mine, James Box, would wisely say, nobody makes a good first pancake. I would look at projects that force you to go out and be creative. Our 100-day projects are really good for that, if it might be writing, drawing, model making, but anything that helps you develop the habit of ongoing creativity, innovative thinking, problem solving. Through lockdown, Lulu Allison ran this campaign called Hatterdays, um, which was a personal project. Back to constraints, she had three constraints. She had to make a hat every Saturday, it had to be made from things that she could find in her house, just found objects, and it must raise money for charity. Those constraints made her create things that she would have never created in any other way. And that's true of musicians. Jeff Tweedy, this book is brilliant, actually, if you're a digital designer. All of the things he talks about on songwriting can be applied to digital design and creativity. Jeff Tweedy would go and write a song before a sound check on a tour. 30 minutes before the band turned up, and the rule he set himself was, I need to play it to the band. And by his own admission, most of them were rubbish. Some of them weren't. So find a time and place, make a commitment, go and make a mark, be creative. And if you're looking for some inspiration of where you can go to um, find that creativity, the Red List of Endangered Crafts is a great starting point. Who knows, you might be the person that saves a dying craft. My second tip is to widen your influences. Um, to become really innovative, you need to start um, getting comfortable with new and different ideas, to set time aside to cross-pollinate your mind. The tendency in business is just to hunker down, go very quickly into building something. But as an innovator, you need to explore new influences and not see that as a luxury or a waste of time, but an essential investment in future innovation. Pick up a new magazine, listen to music you wouldn't normally listen to, go to an exhibition that doesn't immediately appeal to you. Use a new tool or technique, or a familiar one in a different way. But be conscious about getting out of your bubble and trying new things. And the more you do that, the more comfortable you will be with it. And there's a wealth of scientific knowledge um, being undertaken on the brains of innovative people. And one experiment they run in divergent creative thinking is to give you an object and ask how many different ways you can use that object. And then they map the synapses in your mind. Um, think of it as a whose line is it anyway, but with sensors on your brain. And the, the results indicate that innovators think differently. And early research indicates innovative thinking and idea generation can be developed. It's a muscle, it's a, a practice that can be developed. And then my final tip is go for a walk. Literally the first and easiest step to becoming an innovator. Um, there is a great video um, that can be found on YouTube by the behavioralist Marilee Aprizo, where she talks about going out with a problem to ponder. And they're the key words, a problem to ponder. Um, I have a colleague where we were doing a research project. We couldn't see the wood for the trees. We had all the post-it notes, all the data points. We got so fed up being stuck in a room, we went for a walk along Brighton Seafront. Ten minutes later, we'd got to the, the heart of the problem. We got to the insights we wanted. It was changing our location. It was going out for a walk. Think of it as the non-smoker's smoking break. I give you permission to get away from your screens and go out for a walk. It is work. So we've looked at architects, poets, designers, scientists, 
artists, musicians, and designers, and hopefully a few practical tips to help you unleash your inner innovator. I would start by calling yourself an innovator. Think inside the box, generate more ideas, rethink co-design for the people you're designing with, grow your maker mindset, widen your influences, and go for a walk. Let me know how you get on. Let me know your tips for unblocking breakthrough ideas. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you for coming to UX Bright.